Crimes and analogous acts, for the most part, involve easy and simple and immediate gratification of desires, requiring little planning or effort. By contrast, reaching a goal that satisfies a want can be complex, requiring significant planning, skill, and persistent persistence over time. Godfrey and Hershey make the assertion that different types of people will be attracted to acts that are involve simple and easy gratification of desires over acts that involve planning, skill and persistence over time. When they say people, what they really mean is people with different personality types. So a logical question to ask at this point is, what personality types are attracted to simple, easy acts that provide immediate gratification? The answer that Godfrey and Hershey propose to the question, what personality types will be attracted to acts which involve an easy or simple gratification of desire, are those personality types characterized with, by low self-control. There are differences between people in the extent to which they are vulnerable to the temptations of the moment. That is, there are differences between people in terms of their level of self-control. These differences can be observed in childhood. One of the ways differences in children's level of self-control can be measured is by what is known as the marshmallow test. Executive function skills really all work in concert. So working memory, inhibitory control, and cognitive flexibility can be really difficult to disentangle. So the natural course of executive function development is to improve gradually across the um, particularly early uh, preschool years and to peak at not until one's you know, early to mid-twenties. We know that executive function and brain development are highly plastic during these two periods of development in preschool as well as pre-adolescence. The marshmallow test is a measure of delay of gratification. The nature of the, of the experiment is to give children a choice between a smaller reward now and a larger reward later. So in the classic paradigm, children would be offered something like um, one marshmallow now, or if they wait until the experimenter comes back, they could have two marshmallows. So you see this bell right here? This is called the bring me back bell. So sometimes I have to leave the room and go do some work, but you can always bring me back by ringing that bell, okay? Let's try it right now. I'm gonna step outside and you ring the bell and I'll come right back. You ready? In the marshmallow test, we are always sure to ask children if they remember the rule or how this game works. And so that's really important because if they can repeat the rule back to you, then it suggests that they have learned it and, and remembered the rule. The marshmallow test is really measuring all three aspects of executive function. So children have to remember the rule or the goal. So the goal is to, say, receive two marshmallows or whatever treat they choose, and they need to hold that in mind while they're enduring the delay. They also need to use inhibitory control while they're enduring the delay, so being able to resist distractions and to resist the impulse of, say, reaching for the marshmallow or ringing the bell. And then third, they can use their cognitive flexibility to distract themselves from the temptation of the reward. So they might, for example, sing a song, they might um, remind themselves of the goal and actually sing to themselves, if I wait, I get um, two, if I don't wait, I only get one. They might pretend to eat the treats. We've seen all kinds of really interesting behaviors that children do during the delay. So I'm gonna put one here and I'll put two here. Okay. So if you had to choose between the bigger pile and the smaller pile of marshmallows, which one would you choose? The bigger one? There's a lot of them. They're yummy, huh? I have to go and do some work, but while I'm gone, if you wait for me to come back all by myself, when I come back, you can have all of these marshmallows. But you might not want to wait, and that's okay too. 
If you don't want to wait, you just ring the bell and I'll come back right away, okay? But if you ring the bell, you can only have this marshmallow, not those. So if you wait and you don't eat the fish and you don't ring the bell, which plate do you get when I come back? The marshmallow test is challenging because there's a strong uh, desire for immediate gratification. And in order to delay gratification in this task, children need to step back and keep the choice in mind, keep in mind the fact that there is this longer term, larger reward. And they need to, uh, to prioritize that future goal uh, in, in a way that allows them to suppress any tendency to take the immediate reward. So they have to manage their attention. They have to keep their attention focused on what they really want ultimately and resist the temptation to get hijacked by their uh, desire for the marshmallow. Well, I have some work I have to do. See you in a bit. So when a child like B goes directly for the marshmallows, as soon as the experimenter leaves, we can be pretty sure that she hasn't forgotten the rule. Instead, it could be a breakdown in the inhibitory control or impulse control aspect of executive function. So it could be that the temptation was just too great and she does not yet have the working memory and cognitive flexibility skills to help her kind of override that really strong impulse. Mm, looks like you wanted the marshmallows, huh? In this measure, the marshmallow test is also always measuring children's choice. We also are really clear to give children a choice and tell them that there's no right or wrong way to play this game. So when children choose not to delay, we don't really know for sure if it's because they couldn't control themselves or if they simply decided that it wasn't worth it in that case. Okay. Okay. So I'll put those there for you, and I'll see you in a bit. So in contrast to B, Zoe delayed the entire time until the experimenter came back on her own. And uh, in her case, she sat uh, with her hands folded, staring intently at the marshmallows and at the bell. And so in that case, you know, she was able to muster um, the self-control or the impulse control to not reach for the bell or the treats. And she didn't exhibit any kind of overt cognitive strategy or um, cognitive flexibility like we sometimes see with other kids. So it's possible that she was thinking about um, things during the delay that was, that was helping her to do that. Alright, I'm all finished and you waited the whole time. Nice work. So that means you can have this pile, right? Yeah. Are they yummy? In the third case with Sammy, we saw that he also did delay the entire time until the experimenter came back. And he was a little bit more fidgety um, and really tempted by the bell. But he did resist the temptation of ringing the bell, even though kind of during the warm up, um, he couldn't get enough of the bell. What we see with these three different examples is the range of individual differences, roughly at the same age in how children deal with this challenge. So we see both age-related changes that can be pretty predictable where, for example, on that task, older children do tend to delay longer than younger children. But importantly, we also see really striking individual differences at any age, which can be predictive of what's to come later in life. Note that researchers in the video use the term executive function, and the term is also contained in the video's title. Executive function refers to the capacity of the human brain to regulate itself, to tell itself what to do. You engage your executive function in the following situation. Let's imagine you're looking at a menu in a restaurant. You notice that the restaurant is serving a double cheeseburger. Part of you wants to order the cheeseburger. Essentially, this is one part of your brain regulating hunger, which is geared towards desiring fat, salt, and sugar, which provides the urge to order the burger. 
Another part of you knows that this is unhealthy and thinks, I should really order the fish. It would be better for me. You resist the urge to order the burger and have the fish instead. Executive function is the part of your brain that resists the temptation or impulse to order the more desired food. One way to remember this term executive function is to think of the term executive. A CEO is a chief executive officer. Think about it. CEOs don't do sales, marketing, accounts, and budgeting. Rather, they tell these departments what to do, just like the executive function in your brain. Executive functioning is located in the region of the brain known as the prefrontal cortex. How do we know this? Well, people whose prefrontal cortex has become damaged, either through a disease or injury, become significantly more impulsive, say more inappropriate things, and act more rashly, or in other words, exhibit much less self-control than they previously did. So, overall, individuals with low self-control or poor executive functioning have one, a tendency to respond to the here and now, not the future. Two, tend to lack tenacity or persistence with difficult tasks. Three, tend to be adventuresome, risk-taking, and impulsive. Four, tend to be more self-focused and less sensitive to the feelings of others. Very importantly, we are not born with self-control. It must be developed. So where does self-control come from? According to Godfordson and Hershey, it seems that the initial development of self-control occurs over childhood and that parenting plays the most important role in this development. Godfordson and Hershey make the point that much of parental action is geared towards the suppression of impulsive behavior toward making the child consider the long-range consequences of acts and to be sensitive to the needs and feelings of others. So, how is impulse control and sensitivity to the needs of others taught or developed? In other words, what needs to happen to produce self-control? Godfredson and Hershey say at a minimum three things must happen. The child's behavior must be monitored. Deviant behavior when it occurs must be recognized as such. And that deviant behavior must be punished or more so effectively punished. Godfredson and Hershey's point is that anything that interferes with a parent's monitoring, recognizing, and punishing a child's deviant behavior will likely lead to a failure of self of self-control to develop in the child. What factors can contribute to the breakdown of this process of monitoring, recognizing, and punishing? Godfredson proposed three basic interferences. Number one, family size. One of the most consistent findings of delinquency research is that the larger number of children in the family, the greater likelihood that each of them will be delinquent. The simple reason being is that more children puts a strain on parental resources of time and energy, i.e. make it more difficult to do one, two, and three, monitor, recognize, punish. Single parent families one of the most robust predictors of crime in a given neighborhood, area, or community is the percentage of ha households ha headed by a single parent, but particularly single mothers. Individuals from intact families tend to have lower rates of crime. It's very simple. With one parent in the house, it is more difficult, no matter how good that parent is, to monitor recognize and punish a child's deviant behavior than it would be if there were two parents. To end, let me make an overall observation. 
based on the analysis and evidence we have been following. It would seem that of all the factors contributing to criminal behavior, personality structure, that is the collection of traits that form an individual's personality, is the most important. So although, of course, many things can contribute to an individual committing crime, these factors influence crime insofar as they impact the development of personality. But in specific, the aspect of personality referring to the individual self-control. To note, we are not saying that some personalities are criminal, rather that some personality types or structures orientate individuals towards short-term gain, which in turn orientates them towards actions that provide short-term gain, some of which will be defined as criminal. Of course, this is all more complicated than Godfordson and Hersey suggest, and as we shall see. But in a basic sense, the remainder of this course is about looking at how such personality structures develop and the ways that they interact with the environment to produce the behavior that we define as crime. End of Soch 243A Criminology Lecture on the nature of crime and criminality.